Hello and welcome to the German Guy Reviews. Hooligans. What better way is there to show the system that you shit on everything than by, well, shit on everything. Hooliganism has a long and rich history and there are some interesting documentaries out there. There are many different kinds of hooligans, from the political demonstrant that just can't find any other way to express their anger at the ills of the world, to the ones who just want to feel like manly men again, or the downright sociopathic criminal. I don't support such behavior. I think people like that are ruining the game for everybody, just as online trolls do in MMORPGs, nor do I think violence should be a legitimate form of protest. Unless you really do live under a totalitarian government, or you are protesting against something that hasn't changed a bit in decades and shows no signs of change because the political class just doesn't care. But the fact is, this violence exists in the world and the best thing I can do as a white privileged blond blue eyed man is to understand it as best as I can. How do I do this? Through movies of course. In the year 1988, director Alan Clark, who died one year after his last movie, and L. Hunter Ashton, who also died in 2007, made a movie about this little subculture in the film. Where we see Gary Oldman as one of the leaders of a large hooligan group that slowly gets into a gang war with another large hooligan organization, or firm as it is called. And like a good cautionary tale that it is, ends with an important message. Violence, like... Ain't not the answer, man. What followed was a number of hooligan movies in the beginning of the new millennium, most well known the one with Elijah Wood. Yeah, I remember when I first saw it on TV when I was a kid and thought to myself, man, this is a really strange sequel to Lord of the Rings. And then there were even more sequels, which all sucked. Yeah, get this, I found this box with all 7 hooligan movies at the DVD store and spent 30 euros on it, but only the original and the reboot are the only good ones. And because I was cheated out of my money, I felt this unbelievable raging fire in me, this anger, and I wanted to punch someone, someone who is way smaller and weaker than me and doesn't fight back. and. I thought, yeah, maybe that's the whole point, to spread the anarchy. Yeah, I have so much hate for these movies. This series is even so lazy that one of the films cheaply copies the plot of the movie Away Days, which according to Rotten Tomatoes also sucked. Why would you even copy the plot of an already bad movie? To go even lower? Who thought all these movies were necessary? The first film was good, but it wasn't a masterpiece that needs more sequels at all costs. You don't make Star Wars, damn it. It's like someone saw Die Hard and made so many sequels until he rammed that into the ground. Oh wait, that's not a good example. Like someone keeps on making Terminator movies. No. Like there's an endless stream of Pirates of the Caribbean. Okay, why is it Hollywood's goal to piss me off? This movie has a boring protagonist, boring side characters and a conflict that would not even raise my interest if it would pay me for the life-saving operation of an entire puppy family. Oh please notice me senpai, is what the movie says. So without any further distractions, let's take a look at the German hooligan movie Hooligan 6667 Fair Play is Over. The numbers have something to do with some football team winning at some point and I don't care. I don't care about sports at all. And yes, I will call it football, because it makes a ton more sense to call a game where you actually play with your foot football. America, you are so weird. In more than just one way.
we open up the movie with a couple of pictures of our main characters in the football stadium. Wow, don't blow your budget all at once, guys. We actually open up with a guy named Florian, who goes to the bathroom where one of the other dudes named Ötzlem doesn't react to the question if he is okay, because he is busy traveling to the magical realm of flashback land. We then really, really, really begin the story somewhere in the past. Jesus, this movie started like the thousand endings in Lord of the Rings 3 in reverse. Can we start a damn plot now, or are we going to get yet another psych it was all in the character's fantasy inside the Matrix while being on drugs moment? Our hooligans proceed to stick some dude's head in the toilet and light his jacket on fire for committing the horrible crime of being fan of another team. I find this hooligan culture really, really fascinating. Doesn't mean I don't think it's stupid, but it's fascinating. After acting like a bunch of monkeys at the zoo and beating up the bar, they drive back to celebrate the victory. Whatever kind of victory this is. In a club in which a band plays that sounds like the love child of Coldplay and Depeche Mode. Please! I promise you, we have good music over here. It's not like we are a country full of musicians that sound like parody bands. And Rammstein. That doesn't help to support my case. Then the group leader named Group leader? Yeah, I have no idea. You know, it would really help once in a while if characters in a movie speak to each other with their names. I don't even know if the names of the characters I said before are correct, since the IMDb page doesn't even show their pictures. Then again, who does want to be associated with this boring steaming piece of excrement? I guess I will just from now on give them names I find appropriate. Group leader guy gets a phone call and sees person with glasses, writing in his notebook, showing us that he is a totally obsessive compulsive person who has planned out his entire life for the next 30 years. Also known as the German in his natural state. Next couple scenes we learn a few things about our characters. Not their names silly, just that leader guy has a girlfriend. This guy, who I will call police guy, goes completely drunk off his ass to work and that obsessive compulsive guy is obsessive compulsive to his girlfriend as well. And much of a strikingly uninteresting stuff that doesn't in any way further the plot. Is what I would have said if it didn't become clear to me that there isn't much plot to be further to begin with. We learn that this hooligan group is not doing very well, because a lot of the former members have left the group altogether and they don't get a lot of requests from other hooligan groups anymore asking if they want to go somewhere and make trouble. After we have finished watching some even more tiresome scenes of their mundane daily lives, we finally move a bit forward again as Leader Guy and his friends go to the football stadium where Leader Guy gets a phone call from his girlfriend and we have to witness some uninspired awkward relationship talk, while Obsessive Guy is proposing to his girlfriend in front of the entire crowd. And he gets dumped on the spot. Okay movie, I will give you a few golden stars for that. Because I think guys who do such a thing are fucking terrorists. Marry me, or all these people around you will see what a fucking bitch you are. Yes, yes, I know, people think it's charming, and in a way it is, but I don't need to know everyone's personal history to know that there at least got to be 1 or 2% of people who will marry you just because they fear what the public might think. If you do something like this, that's okay, but you need to be 100% sure that he or she would have said yes no matter if you are standing in a stadium or in an empty garage. I mean, I have enough faith in people to think that everybody who does this is very sure. But, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I always got a little bit of sour taste in my mouth when I imagine that maybe this or that couple is getting married and isn't really ready for it yet, but gets unintentionally bullied into it. But hey, isn't that a danger with all marriages? Anyway, our characters start to drown their sorrow in the sweet, sweet rivers of the alcohols. Dude with glasses, still pissed about his loss, is asking one of his friends about a rumor he heard about him going to an AIDS party. What's an AIDS party? It's like a smallpox party. Only with AIDS. 
And yes, this is real. There are news articles about this. There are people who go to parties in order to get AIDS on purpose. Because they think it's exciting to have AIDS. Of course, the guy in the group denies this accusation and they start to fight, causing him to leave. Only that we later find out that he really does go on such... events. We are back to boring boredom again as we see leader guy and AIDS man taking the city train. Oh, come on! Do interesting stuff! A guy walks past them as they are talking about what obsessive person said and gives them some pills which they take without hesitation. I said interesting not retarded. You take drugs that you are not even being told what they are from some random guy? For all you know that could be suicide pills. Oh no, you would never go to AIDS parties. You are way too responsible for that. Lucky for them, they are not even drugs at all, but just placebos. They're gazebos! They're bullshit! They go back to the man that sold them the pills, and then they demand their money back. Hey! Ali! Hey, hey, Sarkino! Sarkino! Come on! You were asking for it, idiot! Who walks up to a drug dealer and goes, Hey, hey, give me my money back! Give me my money back! Give me my money back! His friend takes him back to his home to clean up his wound and give him a band-aid, as Lida Guy's friend suddenly starts to shift the conversation to the subject of his sister, which Lida Guy apparently had sexual intercourse with, and he asks him this wonderful question. Aaron? Is it rasier? La 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 la, roses are red, violets are blue, I don't wanna hear this, so go fuck you. La 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 la. I, I wish I was taking this out of context, but I didn't. This is really how the scene goes. Thank God someone started to dig up the dead corpse of the plot as the group is asked to join in on a big fight in a football match in a few weeks, and they agree. But until we get to that football match, we of course have to sit through a scene where the girlfriend of Liederman finds a diploma, which embarrasses him, because now she knows for a fact that there is much potential in him that he simply wastes. They get in a big fight, which causes the girlfriend to leave him and go to Berlin, where she plans on building her career. Lida guy, however, has no time to get much angry at the moment because he gets a call from his friends telling him of a situation involving neurotic man as he is about to jump from the roof. That's about 7 meters high. It's like, even the movie knows how pathetic it is. Thankfully, Lida guy manages to convince his friend that life is worth living and that he should come with them to their next big fight. Ah, yes. Best idea in the world. Take the mentally unstable person with you to serve your own selfish needs. You are a good friend. As they wait right outside of the city area where the football match is supposed to happen, they are let down by the other hooligan groups, so they are left standing somewhere in the middle of nowhere and can't go to the game, because there are not enough guys. So they spontaneously decide to beat some random people up that happen to wear the colors of the other team and are so surprised that they don't fight back. Not even a little bit. You know, when your friend is back from that private party, you all should make a blood oath. Leader guy drives all the way to Berlin to meet his former girlfriend trying to save their relationship, but she doesn't have any of that, which is why he gets very rude, and because of this, she tells him what a pathetic loser he and his friends are. Oh, take my seat, please, insult him as long as you want. When he comes back home, we learn that the former girlfriend of crazy person has gone missing, so he and his friends search the entire city for her, until police guy just randomly decides to remember that the dude with glasses was working at the garden house of his grandfather. Leader guy goes to said garden house and we see that the woman has been beaten and raped. 
So his friends, who shortly arrive afterwards, do my job for me and applaud sarcastically his groundbreaking selfish stupidity that make him partially responsible for this. And then we get a Bumby's mom death scene transition. From rape to happy music with playing children. Smooth. We cut back to the beginning of the movie, which is the end of the movie. Anyway, we get some half-assed resolution to the plot, with the group breaking apart and our main character standing on the roof, looking over the city and saying the most cliché line of all cliché lines. Stop me if you heard this before. At the end of the day, all doors are open for us. We just have to go through them. Didn't I? Jack, I want you to pay close attention to the following over-the-top eye roll. Oh, brother. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. Please, God Almighty, please absolve me of this movie. And so the credits roll, accompanied by shitty, shitty, shitty music. And before my country loses the last shred of cultural integrity that it has left, I make a cut here and say, this movie I know what they were going for with this film. Our characters are going through a midlife crisis, asking themselves if this really is what they want to do with their lives. How the enthusiasm of the old days is slowly fading away. That becomes clear in one scene, where girlfriend person asks leader person if he doesn't think that it is a little bit strange that he and his friends, mid 30 something men, have nothing better to do than get into fights all the time. Which she tries to explain away with some pseudo-philosophical bullcrap explanation about manhood. If you are really going for this whole men need to be men and behave like men so they can feel like men stuff, then other movies did it way better. In the remake there was this unspoken rule that only those who want to fight do fight. Here there are a bunch of pathetic wankers who pick on people that don't even know what is going on. Which of course is the point and could work. They try to achieve some ideal of manliness but get the complete opposite and bear the consequences. I know the rule in movies is show don't tell but sometimes a good piece of dialogue explaining motivation can help a lot instead of was my sister good in bed? Yeah I will never get over that. I clearly see that there is a good idea for a story here, but if your characters are nothing more than mannequins saying their lines, the best script in the world won't help. Only the neurotic madman had an actual plausible arc to him. The others were just… there. I still don't know why the leader guy has a diploma and yet doesn't do anything with it. Why does the police officer come to work drunk? Or why does that one guy try to get AIDS? None of it is explained. Instead we have to make space for pointless nonsense. What was the point of them buying drugs that were not really drugs? Or that one subplot dedicated to a stolen trophy that was about 20 minutes long that doesn't tie into anything? Yeah, at that point I completely lost all my interest. You could cut down this whole movie down to 30 minutes and had just as much content. So much time that could have been used on character development, completely wasted so that blank slates can stay blank slates. What can I say, if you like seeing assholes being assholes for really no good reason at all, then this movie is for you. All of us should just try some peaceful meditation. The German guy out and... Auf Wiedersehen.